Berkeley Splendid Abodes, the official podcast of Toronto Thelema, exploring, if you will, practical philosophy, from science and the workings of the mind to spirituality, esotericism, and magic. said that causal connection was not merely unprovable but unthinkable, and in shallower waters still, one cannot assign a true reason why water should flow downhill or sugar taste sweet in the mouth. We'll take our first deep dive into David Hume's inquiry into human understanding to learn more about his take on causal connection. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. Welcome back, Michael. Oh, thanks, Darren. Thanks for having me. Today we're going to be looking at Hume. We threatened it in a previous season, <laughs> and now we're doing it. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, we're looking, you suggested an inquiry concerning human understanding, uh, even though the AA reading list uh, suggests the essays of David Hume, we've chosen an inquiry because something else you were reading, uh, Crowley had a footnote referencing the inquiry, which is a more specific target than just the essays. Yeah. So, uh, and because of the specific direction, we thought this would be an appropriate place uh, to look. What did you think of the reading this time? Uh, it's. Uh, I think I mentioned to you in a in a message that it struck me as being kind of a perfect place to as sort of like a beginner starter book for uh, for modern philosophy in a lot of ways. So defend that a little bit. What do you mean? Well, um, you believe in things that are ridiculous. No, I'm I'm trying to use. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm trying to find the fallacies <laughs> to hit um, in my uh, my defense here. Basically, it seems to me that he's he. It's fairly. I think you you had mentioned in the the email that you sent me was saying that you were having a hard time following his uh, argument or understanding him or something. I want to see what you meant by that and get into that a little bit. So mm-hmm. I don't want to offend you by saying that I found it like fairly. Uh, basic yeah. and straightforward. So I don't imagine that's what you were referring to, but um, we'll see. And uh, it, basic and straightforward, once you get past, obviously, the antiquated language in a lot of ways and the overusage of commas, which is one of my pet peeves. <laughs> but, uh, you know, once you get into the rhythm of it, um, it seems very basic and straightforward. He's basically laying out the idea that we use reason, philosophically speaking, Um, And he sets things up where we have moral philosophy versus what he calls abstruse philosophy, (laughs) and uh, which is a very abstruse statement. But he's describing abstruse philosophy as being essentially centered on the reason and uh, moral philosophy as being much more caught up in the passions uh, in a lot of ways. So, we, as far as this abstruse philosophy goes, where we're we're talking about the function of the reason and the application of the reason in philosophical enquiry, he's pretty much laying out the idea that uh, in order for us to actually learn anything from a world around us, we are using the reason, but we can't rely on it a priori, as they commonly say in philosophy, meaning we need to rely on experience, direct experience of things in the world, and learn from experience using the rational. Yeah, well, there's a distinction there that he makes kind of in the early chapters, right, between, uh, I think he calls them chains of ideas and matters of fact. And so when we're talking about inquiries concerning understanding, Um, chains of ideas are fairly easy. The most popular example, and the one he uses here, is like Euclidean geometry, Mm -hmm. where you have these shapes that don't even exist in the real world anyway. Like, you can't draw a straight line to save your life. Like, there's always some margin of error. Mm -hmm. But if you're imagining perfect triangles and perfect circles and perfect squares and things, then you can also imagine ways of dealing with them 
And it all takes place, as you're saying, a priori, like it's all a thought exercise. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to worry about um, inquiries concerning understanding a priori, at least according to Hume. When he talks about the inquirer, he wants to know he wants to know what's going on in this realm of matters of fact. And what he means is our relationship with sense objects. Like the fact that you're over there sitting in front of a microphone uh, with your cool guy glasses on, you know, looking hardcore. Uh, <laughs> those are a bunch of facts. And so he wants to know how you can deal with... And I appreciate uh, Hume uh, acknowledging uh, the, yeah, those facts. Yeah, those were his examples precisely. <laughs> 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 He's ahead of his time. So, so it, it, the subject of the inquiry is uh, is is sort of going to be around matters of fact, rather than at least initially, rather than uh, than chains of ideas. One of the things I found a bit frustrating about this book is, as you're saying, he does start off like a ninth grader. You know, <laughs> you know who who's been assigned in a comparative essay on you know like compare Hamlet to. I don't know, some other 20th century ripoff of Hamlet. And the ninth grader will go like, we'll go like, uh, uh, the Webster's Dictionary defines essay as, <laughs> you know, like, and so, as like, filling out the first 35% of words based on. <laughs> like, he, literally, he literally starts off in his paper on epistemology by saying, there are two kinds of philosophy. And I just thought like, oh my God, <laughs> like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> um, and there are some places where, um, he defends things like his only argument for a point will be, I think this is incontrovertible. Mm -hmm. He doesn't use the word incontrovertible. He says something like, uh, like all, and all no one could possibly on disagree with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is not a great argument, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, it's okay to say you're going to take something as read. You know, I don't want to deal with a priori issues because I think those are pretty straightforward. Uh, someone who doesn't think they're straightforward can deal with them, but I don't want to talk about that here because it seems obvious. But then when you go into the meat of your work and you have four or five bullet points that you need to cover to get through a section and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, all people throughout all history in all cultures have always had the same motives and no one could possibly argue that point. <laughs> no one could ever disagree with me about that, so I don't have to worry about developing yeah. it any further. I found that a bit. Uh, so I, at first, I was I was missing a lot of the points of argument. Uh, I like I thought that I understood what he was saying, but I wasn't able to understand what his supports were because I was just getting hung up on these places where he was bypassing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. where he was bypassing. So I, I think he does have a couple of things in here which are fun uh, arguments to defend different points, but it took me a while to find them, mm -hmm. I guess. Does yeah, and just pin them down, yeah. yeah. And yeah, I mean, as far as going back to the idea that it, I see it as being a, kind of a nice in point for getting to know modern philosophy, just the way in which it approaches the a priori concept or a priori as english people tend to <laughs> say it that subject can be pretty heady and, and confusing when you just jump into kant or you know can't as english people say it uh <laughs> so like a lot a lot of these other philosophers that i've jumped into in the past it's like you know you just feel like you're swimming for your life in a storm in the middle of a storm uh but that again is probably because i'm an uneducated uncouth person who uh, didn't go through any of the academic studies that, uh, you know, a lot of people would be assumed to have taken for this type of subject matter when we get into the really deep academic terminologies and whatnot. Yeah, I think that's a good point. The, the conceit of our podcast has always been that you and I aren't actually experts mm -hmm. and uh, that we can pick up a piece of text, sometimes when we've never read, sometimes when we haven't read in a while and think about it carefully and then have kind of a, a, a discussion that's hopefully meaningful, uh, perhaps demonstrating to others that they would be capable of doing similar things. Like my pathos here is that it's, oh, that the, that the primary source texts for Thelema aren't actually that inaccessible and that even when they are difficult, people can still address them and get something out of them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, 
And as it turns out, 11 years of study in a particular uh, area, regardless of, you know, the conceit of your radio show <laughs> actually does give you a background for understanding <laughs> the material because picking this up uh this this piece of material up to for something in which i actually am a virgin you know mm. like uh i have read very little ph- philosophical work and uh and no david hume mm-hmm. uh it, it was more challenging to get through the layers of this so maybe it made me more empathetic to people who are uh, suffering from crowley <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> i know right Right. Yeah. It's uh, I think uh, somebody pointed out that me and a few other people in the social in the in-person social gatherings will tend to have higher level conversations about Thelema. And uh, for whatever reason, that kind of hit me. I reacted in a surprised way. And then uh, it took me some actual consideration because of the fact that it's like, yeah, I think that's the problem with uh, operating on a high level of a particular subject is the fact that you're probably oblivious to exactly where you're operating um especially if you like that whole denning kruger kind of effect as laid out uh, popularly where it's like you know if you there's those people who understand a subject who assume everybody else understands it as well right and i tend to fall into that you know uh <laughs> that kind of uh frame of mind i was thinking about that recently even just with uh, being obsessive about movies and filmmakers and stuff recently and thinking about um like some specific movies that i was sharing pictures of on instagram and thinking to myself well everybody else is going to be able to appreciate you know for instance orson welles directed lady from shanghai mm-hmm. and it's like who the hell is gonna know that you know (laughs) we can get frustrated uh, as occultists with this uh, sort of beginner book culture of people who you know make their whole living republishing the same four facts about the same you know introductory (laughs) material and every four years they put out a new book and uh, it's because that those are the books that sell because mm. the people don't stick around long enough to get deep into it. And so, you know, even though you would, don't want to be like, oh, you know, the pentagram ritual has been rehashed a million times. It's in Lieber O. People can just read Lieber O. The fact is that they they haven't often. So when you go to mm. talk to people about this stuff, uh, it can be surprising how basic you have to get. So. Yeah. Uh, It's partly the, if you're going to rant and rave about beginner book culture, it's partly the audience's fault, right? Because they don't approach the the core material and, you know, they they eat up the beginner books. You hear that audience? If there's an audience (laughs) for it, then then there's going to be some shyster. (laughs) (laughs) Some huckster, you mean? They're feeding that, uh, you wanted me to say, there's going to be some huckster out there feeding (laughs) feeding the audience. You can cut around that however you want. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So we agreed to start our analysis on page 21 of this, uh, section 5, Skeptical Solution to These Doubts. So if we just continue talking through in a quick way what the problem is, the problem is, uh, we're, so we'll exclude anyth- anything a priori, and we'll just look at matters of fact. We'll look at how we can know things about our world. And uh, he says it's obvious that we can observe events. Um, uh, but he thinks that causes are opaque. It's just one event and then the next event and then the next event. And the, the, the famous example of the, of the snooker tournament, you know, when one, one billiard ball hits another billiard ball and, and transfers the force and then the, the new billiard ball starts moving. There's a way in which we're just, uh, explaining the obscure by the more obscure you know it's like well what does the word force mean what does the word transfer mean and no matter how granular you get it doesn't actually solve the problem because Mm -hmm. you can think of it on an electron level or on an atomic level or and 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 see certain things believe that you see certain things happening but what you see happening uh is still just a series of events and so the question is um how can we do science at all because science requires us to control variables and make postulates that have predictive power 
But if we don't believe in causes, you know, or, or we don't, we can't observe causes, we can only observe this event, then that event, then that event, then that event, then how do we develop an understanding? Right. So this is this is the question. When we're just looking at a series of events, where does this notion of causation come from? How can we say that one event causes the next event? Yeah. And why do we why do we have an inborn, uh, apparently inborn, innate uh, predictive ability at all? How how are we that how does that actually happen in reality where we uh, we see something happening and we know that something particular will follow it or we can reasonably assume that something will follow it so it's like trying to assess that quality in us and actually I find that billiard ball example that he gives is a really good one for conjuring the idea to mind because the way that he uh, describes it is like if you picture one billiard ball rolling across the table and then coming up against the next billiard ball and just stopping and both of them just stopping all together, that feels wrong. And if you instead picture it hitting it and knocking the next one over, that chords more, there's a feeling that goes with that, that it accompanies imagining those two different uh, outcomes. So there's a, a because of that intrinsic feeling like there's a truthfulness to the transfer of force as a predictive quality uh, that happens in us, uh, he, he sort of asks the question of like, well, uh, what's the difference? Why do we end up with that difference? How does that become? He ends up with the uh, – using the argument that that, be, that is because of custom, as he puts it. That's right. So that's what I was going to say. In chapter 4, he says the kinds of things that you're saying. But in chapter 3, he says it's, uh, it's equally reasonable – to imagine that both balls would just stop, that one ball would fly straight up into the yeah. air. Uh, uh, you know, th- those things can be imagined just those as a priori. easily as, as, being ima- as some other thing being imagined. Yeah, a, a priori, yeah. that would be like just as reasonable to assume that would happen as anything else. And to say the sun will not rise tomorrow is another one of his examples, is just as easily comprehensible mm-hmm. as the sun will rise tomorrow. You know, both of those things... I, when I say the words, you understand what I'm saying. So, what he's trying to illustrate is that it's not an a priori faculty that 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 mm-hmm. that that teaches us how objects move and how one thing's caused to be another thing. But you're right. the The fourth chapter is all all going to be about customs, and so uh, he he will appeal to like Adam. He'll go back to the Garden of Eden a couple of times, and once mention Adam by name. But in this chapter, just sort of refer to him. He says, uh, "Suppose a person, though endowed with the strongest faculties of reason and reflection, to be brought on a sudden into the world. So a fully developed person with." All, all the faculties of reason and reflection, they're just brought suddenly into the world, he would indeed immediately observe a continual succession of objects and one event following another. But he would not be able to discover anything further. He would not, at first, by any reasoning, be able to reach the idea of cause and uh, uh, this says cause and effect, since the particular powers by which all natural operations are performed never appears to the senses, nor is it reasonable to conclude merely because one event in one instance precedes another, that therefore the one is the cause, the other the effect. There conjunction may be arbitrary and casual. There be, may be no reason to infer the existence of one from the appearance of another. And in a word, such a person, without more experience, could never employ his conjecture and reasoning concerning any matter of fact, or to be assured of anything beyond what was immediately present to the to his memory and senses. And I have, uh, he has, I have snooker, sunrise, bread, and um, I don't know what that word is, but I wrote down snooker, sunrise, bread, and something else. Uh, and so we've already given the sunrise and the snooker example. Bread, he means um, that you can't tell from looking at this mm, object that, it that it's going to be – that has a nourishing quality, right? And so um, – and the bread example is really important because the bread example introduces what he's going to call secret powers, mm. which are going to come up later. So, the fact that when you eat bread, you're nourished and can live another 
day, you know, and have the energy to do work and all this stuff. We can think of that as being a secret power of the bread. And maybe that makes it really clear, like nothing about looking at bread tells mm-hmm. you that you should eat it necessarily, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, and babies, when they're learning to eat, just put everything in their mouths, mm-hmm. or they watch their parents and eat what their parents eat, you know. This is really clear that we're learning about nourishment from experience, not from not mm-hmm. from instinct. Suckling at a breast is a little bit different. There's an instinct around that. But, uh, um, but when it comes to, to identifying objects that will provide nourishment, that, that really requires knowledge. And it really is sort of like a secret power, the, the, what mm-hmm. he calls a secret power of the object. And so if you want to think that bread causes you to be nourished, um, you can think about these other things. You know, the, the snooker ball is a vehicle for kinetic energy, uh, that, that that there's a power analogous in the snooker ball, say its weight or its volition or something that uh, that is secret to us, not apprehensible to our, our senses, mm-hmm. that we can't say anything rational. Uh, well, we can maybe say things that are rational, but we can't say anything um, definitive about it, he thinks. Yeah. Yeah, so uh so really he's he's laying out this whole idea of the uh the fact that we're not entirely really relying on reason to understand the world around us. That's kind of the most important part of the thesis it seems like. Uh and it seemed like he was getting on to something interesting to me there with that subject of like this idea of I mean he's putting it as secret powers which is a little bit of um uh it's just a difficult subject because of the fact that it's like it's what's not apparent from your direct sensory data. And it's uh, not apparent from any a priori reasoning or anything like that. Uh, so it's something that you have to learn by experience. And that's what he's getting at for the overall the piece here. Uh, but that idea, again, like pick, using the billiard ball thing, for instance, uh, the feeling that's more immediate with the uh, expectation of the transference of energy so that you see the, the ball hitting the other ball and the other ball reacting to that, uh, as opposed to the ball hitting the other ball and both of them immediately becoming static as if it was like a pause on a video or something like that. Uh, the The feeling difference... Uh, says to me that uh, it's like you're being imprinted. Like, uh, you know, when you when you have an experience of something, you're imprinted uh, with a tendency to react to the same, with the expectation that you're going to end up with the same thing. And that seems like an evolutionary thing where it's like, that's the most reasonable thing to possibly predict is that, you know, certain circumstances are going to have the same results and obviously that's not always going to be a perfect um thing to go by but that's why we have so many more complicating things going on right up to and including the reason uh so that that you could kind of like see that as being like an innate thing in life form so like in other animals as well where they just naturally when they first experience something for the first time it imprints something so that there's a natural tendency to react to other situations in the same way he's gonna um talk about this a little later the way in which sort of like objects appear to the mind or something like that and and yes leave a leave a record that you sort of return to and return to and the the more objects appear to the mind the more salient they become and so 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 yeah it's it's he's trying to he's describing learning by observation but in in this sort of spooky way where he talks about creating images of objects Mm -hmm. basically trying to get around the fact that we're not reasoning these things out you Mm -hmm. know we're not we're not following a methodical process of reasoning to understand that the ball will knock the other ball Mm -hmm. and the the food will contain nourishment and that sort of thing we're not learning these things by that process of reasoning no but he's trying to buy us back and eventually will buy us back um, the the capacity to, to apply reason, <laughs> uh, um, but we're still we're still not there. We're still living in this place where what are you know we don't what are causes? We can't observe causes, and that's a big problem still. Mm. Uh, um, and here's what we're talking about. Uh, suppose again that 
uh, Adam has acquired more experience and has lived so long in the world as to have observed familiar objects or events to be constantly conjoined together. What is the consequence of this experience? He immediately infers the existence of one object from the appearance of another. Yet he has not, by all his experience, acquired any knowledge of the secret power by which one produces the other. Nor is it, by any process of reasoning, is he engaged to draw this inference. Right? So, so he, still, uh, he still can't observe secret powers. Um, but now he's, he's able to connect thoughts together and see uh oh you know movement transfer movement can be transferred between objects or when i see one object hit another i know that the that the next object is also going to move he you know and the way you have to parse this is a little bit specific because you're not saying one object is causing the next one to move or that the force is transferred but you see one object hit the other and the next one move Mm-hmm. And it's really, really important that no matter how to, to so I'm going to express it again. No matter how granular you get, you still aren't seeing causes, mm-hmm. right? Like the the secret power of bread to nourish the body. We can say, okay, so now we know that uh, pancreatic juice uh, with pepsin and all these other enzymes is good for dissolving meat, and that in the liver the proteins are broken down and reassembled to become the proteins the body most need, and that those can be passed to cells to that can use them as building blocks. Well, sure, blocks we all know create, that. Yeah, create you know, like, but but it's it's not. Even though it looks like um, a, an explanation of how um, uh, how food provides nourishment, it's still just it, it's still just one event after the next event after the next event, and what the 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 causal piece in the chain is still missing. No matter how granular your your observations are, you can't see that one event is causing another, you still only see the individual events in, in succession. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the question is, how has Adam acquired this predictive power that he can now, you know, uh, um, see that uh, all the fruits of the garden except for the fruit, fruit of the knowledge of good and evil are good <laughs> to nourish the body? And how is it that he can see that, like, stones falling down rocks will you know stone that a stone being thrown at your child will you know <laughs> do the first murder or whatever uh um and you, so this is the it, he'll introduce the word um custom he says the principle is custom or habit perhaps we can push our inquiries no further or pretend to give cause of this cause but must rest contented with this as the ultimate principle, which we can assign all of our conclusions from experience. It is sufficient satisfaction that can go far without repining uh, the narrowness of the, our faculties because they will carry us no further. Uh, the hypothesis seems even the only one which explains the difficulty, why we draw from thousand instances and inferences which we are not able to draw from one instance, this is in no respect different from them. When he says custom, he means just like, you know, Canadians take off their shoes when they go into the house, and Americans often don't take off their shoes when they go into this house. There's a, there's a custom. Uh, people become accustomed to doing particular def- behaviors in particular circumstances. People also become accustomed to the custom that objects have of behaving in a particular way in particular circumstances. So the sun rises every morning because that's its custom. And if one morning it doesn't rise, um, that will be an interesting anomaly. But it's what we're observing is not causes, uh, we're, but we're observing sort of tendencies to behave in a, in a specific way. And so, um, and and he'll call these tendencies customs. And so you can, you can see these customs and that can begin to give you a way of, of, of doing science, right? Like that's the mystery is if we can't observe causes, how can we control variables? How can we, uh, make, make predictions that have, how can we make theories that have predictive power? Well, we can work with these things that are called customs, the habit of one uh, mm-hmm. uh, of, of one object to interact. He with also another. comes to settle on the word belief mm. uh, in the same context 
as well, uh, which is an interesting um, elaboration on it because it feels like he's not... Uh, I get the sense that he's not completely pinned down the thing. He's kind of, uh, even like the idea of custom habit and belief feel a bit like mm, products of mm-hmm. the, the thing that's caused. So again, it's like another, yet another cause that we haven't, we haven't got the ability to completely nail down. But, uh, yeah, when it comes to the belief aspect, that's, uh, again, it's kind of a nice way of distinguishing between, again, once again, the uh, expectation that the ball is going to strike the other ball and send it across the table versus the uh, imagination of it just stopping entirely uh, on contact. Uh, the belief uh, is is more immediate and powerful and overriding and uh the imagination of the other circumstance is not nearly so powerful he says that the difference is essentially just in degree so that the belief is just a stronger degree of the two uh does he say that well, i don't know I if he puts it in the out. term degree but he 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 does say that uh um between the two like what makes the uh belief or custom more powerful is just the uh it's like the intensity of the the feeling associated with it. Yeah, he's going to go there's a part 2 to this uh section 5 uh that begins at paragraph 39 where he says nothing is more free than the imagination of man. Uh for as the mind has authority over all its ideas, it could voluntarily annex this particular idea to any fiction and consequently be able to believe whatever it pleases, contrary to what we find in daily experience. We can, in our conception, join the head of a man to the body of a horse, but it is not in our power to believe that such an animal has ever really existed. It follows, therefore, that the difference between fiction and belief lies in some sentiment or feeling which is annexed to the latter and not to the former, which depends not on will, nor can it be commanded at pleasure. So I, I'm going to quibble a little bit with, uh, with degree, although I have the book in front of me and all these quotations marked out, and you're doing this from memory <laughs> and are going step by step for the <laughs> argument, which is incredible. <laughs> you're predicting everything I've written down to read right off the top of your head. And honestly, I think there's like a par- <laughs> like a sentence to come that it confirms what I was saying. But uh. <laughs> uh, okay, well then let's uh, let's let's read a, a little bit more. Uh, so he's going to say. So here he says um, that there needs to be some sentiment or feeling that belief is not just. I think not just a matter of degree, but has this something super added to it mm-hmm, and i um, agree with that can, do you have your copy of the book can you yep. find what you're what What's you want to read uh, page you're at right now i'm on page 25 about halfway down yes yeah, so this is where he does get into the uh were we to attempt a definition of the sentiment we should perhaps find it very difficult if not an impossible task in the same manner as if we should endeavor to define the feeling of cold or passion of anger to a creature who never had any experience of these sentiments. Uh, he is, it, it is kind of like grade nine. It, type it of pisses thing. me off so much. Like it, it, it's every, like the taste of strawberries, you know, that it's like every, everything that you get really excited about when you're, you know, <laughs> every, every section begins with three paragraphs of non sequitur about how difficult it is to do <laughs> philosophy. And then when he, when he, he, when he defines a term, he always says, and maybe that's it. Maybe that's as far as we could possibly go. Maybe <laughs> yeah. that's as far as any sane person, any smart, you know, but I'm, you know, I'm not sane. I'm not, you know, I can go, let's just take one step further. If we're careful, maybe we can go one step further. <laughs> but so yeah, silly. down a little further, he does say, I say, then that belief is nothing but a more vivid, lively, forcible, firm, steady conception of an object than what the imagination alone is ever able to attain. Uh, I um, uh, have that exact sentence in quotation marks as the next thing I wanted to read. We have been doing this together for too long, Darren. (laughs) 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 We're on exactly the same page. Uh, about what's the, important. Yeah, the listeners may not realize that uh, your head is coming out of one shoulder and mine is coming out of the other. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, so I guess that does make it sound like a matter of degree. It says, uh, nothing but a more vivid, lively, forthful, steady, firm conception of an object. And so, but the, the thing that makes it, uh, that, that makes it not degree, you know, a belief is just not, is not just a more sure fiction. It's a more vivid conception of an object. And so, whereas I would say a fiction is maybe not a conception of an object, mm. and maybe this is explaining, uh, what does he say? What's the word he says? Uh, this is explaining what the sentiment is. The sentiment is this direct connection to an object as opposed to something that exists in the imagination. Yeah, he says, but as it is impossible that this faculty of imagination can ever of itself reach belief... It is evident that belief consists not in the peculiar nature or order of ideas, but in the manner of their conception and in their feeling to the mind. Uh, so he is kind of saying the same thing that we're agreeing to here. Um, so, yeah, my idea that he was specifically going with. Do you see that where they put those quotation marks? <laughs> <laughs> Yet again, covering that same read. little uh, sentence there. Uh, <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, we may make use of words which express something near to it, but its true and proper name, as we observed before, is belief, which is a term that everyone sufficiently understands in common. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I know I understand mm. it. I and believe in, I understand it. And in philosophy, we can go no further than to ex assert that a belief is something felt by the mind, which distinguishes the idea of judgment from the fictions of the imagination. That gives them more weight and influence, making them appear greater. And, and, and what he's getting at here is, is that um, beliefs come from the resemblance, contiguity, and causation of other things that are observed. You know, we see once we've had this practice, like, you know, Adam spending years in the garden doing observations, once we've had this practice of of observing lots of things and, and noting their customs, then we can begin to develop beliefs about those customs. And if we imagine a centaur, which is his example here, the, the head and shoulders of a man on the body of a horse, we know that we've never seen anything like that. And that, in fact, we've seen the head and shoulders of a man, we've seen the body of the horse, and we know that those two things don't fit together, especially if we've seen lots and lots of skeletons, because we know animals al almost never have more than one set of shoulder girdles, right? Like, mm -hmm. unless you're talking about caterpillars. So, for the the the... the centaur's front legs and then the man's head and shoulders uh it just it's it makes nonsense and we can we can have a belief about that that is a, a reference to observation so this is really the scientific method carefully described right like all our all our beliefs have to reference our observations of dis of these discrete objects. So even if we don't have causation, we still have custom, we have observations of discrete objects, and we know that we can't form beliefs in the absence of those things. We can, you know, nothing is more free than the imagination of man, he says. It's just one of the nicest things he says in the, the, yeah. whole, the whole story. It's fun. Um, well, we have to get to his, his definition of liberty as well to but, have a full picture of that. But the, the, the freedom of the imagination imagination of man uh, doesn't mean we're free to believe anything we want. It means we're sort of uh, free to inhabit these We are customs. unconstrained. Yeah. 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 It, it, we, we're, we're free to inhabit mental territory uh, without reference to custom, but we know that that's and we're fiction. still we're still mashing up different ideas that we've already come into contact with. So that's one of the most important things with regard to the imagination that he gets at is that we can only imagine things we've experienced, which is a common uh, truism that people like to to reference, especially in grade nine. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's the idea that uh, everything you can imagine you is something you've already experienced in some way. And it's just different combinations of that. So you can't imagine something you've literally never had any experience of. That's what he's claiming. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, well, you can, so it's, it's a little bit pickier than that. The, 
you can't believe anything you've never had an experience of. Uh, you can imagine a centaur, and that's you know you've never had. But the yet experience again, of a that's centaur, that's but, a combination of ideas that you have experienced. Sure. Right. So I think that's one of the things that he references is that even when you do imagine something you've never actually experienced, it's a combination of ideas that you based on things you have experienced. Yeah, that's really good. Can we find where he he says that? Because oh, that's could, a yeah. uh, that's a, an interesting point that we can take on. Um, so I'm looking around for what, we're, what I was referring to, and I'm not, uh, it might be a little bit too, and because I don't have it labeled out in specific where to find it, um, it might be a little bit too clumsy to find it. But um, it, I'm noticing one passage that's kind of fun. Uh, where he's saying the ceremonies of the Roman Catholic religion may be considered as instances of the same nature. The devotees of that superstition usually plead in excuse for the mummeries with which they are abraded that they feel the good effect of those external motions and postures and actions in enlivening their devotion and quickening their fervor, which otherwise would decay if directed entirely to distant and immaterial objects, we shadow out the objects of our faith, say they, in sensible types and images, and render them more present to us by the immediate presence of these types than it is possible for us to do merely by an intellectual view and contemplation. And I thought that was really interesting because it's really touching on something that's important for us as ma magicians – and uh, as in people interested in the idea of religion and that sort of thing, where he's clearly speaking as an Englishman in 17 – and uh, basically in a world of Protestantism where they're always going to be talking smack about the Catholic Church and referring to it as a lot of superstition when it comes to things like idols – uh, like the uh, just the crucifix being considered an idol and, and having all these things that they're praising and that sort of thing. So here he's talking specifically about that and how they claim, they being the Catholics, claim that it creates a, a more immediate sense of belief and uh, impact because of it than it would otherwise without having that there. I think it's not just uh, the difference between Protestantism and Catholicism. I think it's sort of like a post ref post not post Reformation, like a post Enlightenment thing. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons Crowley says to look at these essays again, not the inquiries, but the essays, mm -hmm. um, is uh, that they're masterpieces of skepticism in prose. Um, and I get the sense from reading this uh, that Hume might take a skeptical view of uh of divinity whole cloth you know mm -hmm. like um and so when he talks about uh, what does he call them superstitious people uh coveting um relics and stuff like this and yeah. how the best relics are the relics that were closest to the saints like either bits of hair or objects they used in their day-to-day -day life that what he's talking about is the is the power human beings have to cultivate beliefs by manufacturing a kind of evidence that's that's self-satisfying you know mm -hmm. and so other sort of skeptical philosophers have been able to be skeptical about much more than Hume is here, right? Like Descartes doubts all of existence in his meditations mm. on first philosophy uh, and gets them and gets existence back by believing in God. And Kant doubts our ability to observe objects at all in about 50 years. I think Kant and Hume are contemporaries, but uh, um, Kant might be reading this and, mm -hmm. and, and producing his work partly in response. Because uh, I think they're, I, I think the prolegomena to any future metaphysics, which seems to be covering some of the same material, uh, happens in about forty uh, about forty years from now. But Hume ad admits that we can observe objects, and uh, and and doesn't isn't as radically skeptical about that as as some others. But he seems to be skeptical about what our relationship to the divine. Yeah. looks like and and there's different places where he's not sure how to address 
This is God a really important his picture and aspect stuff like of this that, paper. Right? Yeah, because it's here he's going to be uh, like, I think I get the I get the sense that he's either quite capable of destroying religion by uh, one fell swoop of his uh, his interpretation of reason and and the skeptical process. Uh, on the one hand, but um, it's tough to tell if he's really sincere about the way that he describes himself as basically like his way out of it for Christianity. He uses pagan uh, miracles later on and uh, pagan beliefs and things uh, as superstitions and miracles as poor witnesses or, you know, testimony that witness testimony that you can't rely on and that sort of thing. Uh, He uses all these things to uh, show that our reason can destroy uh, these things as being supposed evidence of anything, uh, which is just as easily applied to Christianity. But he he tries to sidestep that by using the idea that Christianity is based on faith. And not mm-hmm. on this uh, process of reasoning, uh, which to me just smacks of, you know, weaseling out of uh, having to deal with the situation. But it could just as easily be that he is trying to sow the seeds of that skepticism to undermine uh, the religious doctrines and whatnot without being overt about it because it's not – it's still, you know, in a in an age where it's, it's problematic potentially for someone to just take on uh, the church uh, full force and that sort of thing. We're going to get to the hard problem of evil eventually and in a chapter that I've uh, m- marked out far fewer quotations <laughs> on, uh, but he has a particular take on the hard problem of evil. Uh, which uh, makes it difficult for us to uh, uh, relate to God in a in a comfortable way, you know. And mm. he's he's obviously worried about this. So yeah. Um, uh, but here, what we have is beliefs being ideas that reference experience that reference objects and customs and so that allows us to do hopefully some scientific work but it's also interesting the way in which we can be we can kind of deceive ourselves and and create the conditions of belief by building objects that relate to our fictions and and sort of reinforce those ideas by reference to some material object. And so, like, I'm thinking about Crowley saying that every magician should do a Eucharist every day, you know, take an mm-hmm. object symbolic of the whole universe, make it God, and then consume it. Um, this is a direct physical relationship with god you know like we're like we take the object we make it god and then we put our we we are nourished by it literally we put ourselves in this uh in in this very visceral physical relationship with it also uh consuming something is a way of destroying it right so Mm. like we're enacting the zero equals two formula by taking the whole the 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 whole the symbolic of the whole creation and god Mm -hmm. and then destroying both ourselves and the object in the act of Eucharist by consuming it. Um, and so, uh, there's this, there's this way of, of vivifying our, our faith and our practice through these, um, uh, by deliberately enacting these, enacting these rituals. And he also talks about how, like, you know, if you're trying to think of a friend who's away on vacation, it's better if you have a photograph or probably not a photograph in 1750, but like a painting of them or some image of them. Yeah. Or, you know, he says it's easier to imagine home when you're closer to home because you're more surrounded by things that remind you of home. Whereas if you go completely to a different country or something like that, the things around you uh, won't be as as vivid and so they won't feed your belief mm-hmm. in home as much so then it, it does begin to look like a matter of degree right because you you do have a belief in home like you've been there and you have a justified belief in home because like you've experienced it and you do remember it um but by being away from home um uh you see fewer of the objects of home and it and you, it comes less vividly to mind, so it becomes almost more akin to one of these fictions. You know, yeah. there's so there there is a 
I still think it's a, a, a qualitative, not a quantitative difference, but it's muddied by this suggestion that um, that we grow distant from things without yeah. direct appeal to them. Yeah, it make, it puts me in mind of the idea of nostalgia, for instance, and the uh, the idea that, say, for instance, particularly in the case of something that you haven't sensed in a while, like, say, for instance, something that you, uh, a particular scent that you haven't smelt in a long time, usually... Going back to the idea of strawberries, uh, the, the scent of strawberries, uh, you know, when you smell fresh strawberries you, and you haven't smelt them since last year, it usually brings you right back to last August or mm-hmm. whenever, you know, uh, early September. Um, or if you haven't experienced something, some particular environment since you were a little kid, maybe returning to some neighborhood that you grew up in or something like that, and it just slams you back into that place um it's not really necessarily pertinent to what's being talked about here but it is in a sense where it's like something that's imprinted it it kind of alludes to uh the functioning of the mind and the most important element of what we're talking about here is just uh as far as i can understand it is the difference between these kinds of experiences And functionings of the mind in the way that they enable us to interact with the world around us and understand the world around us versus the reason and uh, the process of reasoning things out. It, It is certain that distance diminishes the force of every idea and that upon our approach to any object, though it does not discover itself to our senses, it operates upon the mind with an influence which imitates an immediate impression. The thinking on any object readily transports the mind to what is contiguous, but it is only the actual presence of an object that transports with superior vivacity. (laughs) (laughs) I'm pretty sure I marked that out to read only because I wanted to say vivacity. (laughs) Nicely done. We should include this, although I thought it would be more important than it is. He doesn't go back to this very often. The way in which objects relate to each other is important, right? He's talking about these customs. Uh, and, uh, and, and so he said, we have already observed that nature has established connections among particular ideas and that no sooner one idea occurs to our thought than it introduces its correlative and carries our attention towards it by gentle and insensible movement. These principles of connection or association which we have reduced to three, namely resemblance, contiguity, and causation, which are the only bonds that unite our thoughts together and beget their regular train of reflection or discourse, which in greater or lesser degree take place among all mankind. So, uh, resemblance, uh, we see connections between objects that are similar to each other, contiguity, uh, which means uh, frequency of their appearance. We notice patterns. So, if, uh, if one object shows up, tends to show up shortly after another object, uh, for example, if pregnancy shows up after sex or something like that, then we begin to notice objects that happen in a series. And then the last one, which I find very perplexing and will continue to frustrate me throughout the whole rest of the paper, is causation. Because the whole point of the paper is explaining how what our picture of the world should look like if we can't observe causes. Mm-hmm. But then one of the three ways in which we understand relations is cause, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, it's gonna it's gonna drive me crazy. Um, uh, he he sort of comes up with a definition of cause eventually. The uh, those three things sound like associations that are built. That's so, right. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, I could see where causation in this respect is associating a cause rather than uh, being able to understand a true deeper cause. If that makes sense. I think he says. Yeah, maybe you're right. Because I thought he said something about nature. Nature associates ideas through, but it it seems like he doesn't say that. I was just misremembering what I read <laughs> only moments ago. <laughs> um, 
Yes. So in section seven, the idea of necessary connection, um, he's going to finally give us a definition of cause, which we're allowed to, which we're allowed to use. Um, but let's go to, let's let's deal with the sections in order. Let's go to this short section of probability uh, first, because I actually think that what's going on here is a little bit in a little bit interesting, and I think we can deal with it pretty quickly. And if Hume has done something a little bit interesting, he'll have done his job. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thank God, finally something a little bit interesting. <laughs> no, I. Th- you know what? The paper is fine. It, yeah, the, discussing it gives us, like you're saying, it's it's a pretty basic introduction to epistemology, to, and and gives people an idea of what it means to think about thinking. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and it really anticipates a lot of what would come. You know, yeah. including Nietzsche and Kant, mm-hmm. not in that order, but yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. Uh, it inversely anticipates a lot of what we're going to And it's not radically counterintuitive, right? Like, you don't have to jump through a lot of hoops yeah. to, 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 to get on his team. So even though I think it's weak when he says no one could possibly disagree with me, the ways in which he, his view overlaps with the naive rationalist perspective actually is helpful for people who are reading about epistemology for the first time, because in some ways it's an explanation of what they already believe, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, yeah, it's uh, kind of like one of those, uh, you know, the, the late night drinking conversations that uh, mm-hmm. that you and your friends have solving all the problems of reality and yeah, yeah, existence yeah. and then you forget about them but he's managed to retain them in a <laughs> yeah. in a paper here maybe that's what it is maybe it's not a ninth grade paper maybe he's just drunk <laughs> <laughs> um but so i think what he says here This basic explanation of how probability works, where you have, you know, let's say you have a six-sided die, and you put the number four on four sides, and you put the number two on two sides, and then it's like uh, um, uh, sort of twice as likely that you'll roll a four as that you'll roll a two. Um, That's not the important part of this. You know, we can, we know how probability works, right? Like there's uh, but in absence of causation, right, we can't say that we're we're twice as likely to roll a four than a two in any meaningful way because that would be postulating a cause. That would be like, yeah, because there's more sides mm. that have a four, we know that a four is a more likely outcome. We can't really say that because that's that's too that's too much of a causal relationship. Yeah. So essentially like as if the the effects are not connected to any kind of cause, then they are completely arbitrary in relation to whatever uh, came before them. But he says, but finding a greater number of sides concur in one event than the other, the mind is carried more frequently to that event and meets it oftener in revolving the various possibilities or chances on which the ultimate results depend. This concurrence of several views in one particular event begets immediately by an inexplicable contrivance of nature, the sentiment of belief, and gives gives that event the advantage over its antagonists, which is supposed by a similar number of views and recurs less frequently to the mind. If we allow that belief is nothing but a firmer and stronger conception of an object than what attends the mere fictions of imagination, this operation may perhaps in some measure be accounted for. The concurrence of these several views or glimpses imprints the idea more strongly on the imagination and gives it superior force and vigor and renders its influence on the passions and affections more sensible in a word begets that reliance or security which constitutes the nature of belief and opinion so when you're looking at the die you know and you're looking at all the sides and counting them up to decide what the probabilities are what you're doing is seeing the number four four times and seeing the number two two times uh so you come up with this account of of probability that that tells you, oh, uh, um, I expect this to come up a four 
because I know I've I've seen more fours than I've seen twos. I've seen about you know sixty six percent of these numbers are fours. Thirty three percent only three thirty three percent of them are are twos. So my prediction is more likely going to be a four because I've seen fours more often. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's it's not about the the fact that the 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 more faces on the die cause a more likely outcome so it's not like it, talking about statistical analysis it's, it's talking it's about just that, the imprinting it's just of that you belief. you you feel you have this belief mm-hmm. that that uh and that might have been the uh, more the sentence that drove me to associate uh the idea of degree being mm-hmm. somehow caught up in belief in his uh, estimation, so yeah, it's 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 sort of like it's so so the way we do probability is by by believing more strongly in one possible outcome than another, and the way we develop those beliefs is by looking at all the options and seeing one option more times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I you know I. Uh, and and every time I play the lottery and lose, <laughs> you know, I'm more likely to expect to to be less excited <laughs> about seeing the draw. <laughs> but also, if I just were to put all the numbers in front of me, like every single possible number, and someone says, you know, only one of those is going to come up, I can see one and then I can see the others and I can imagine, you know, uh, it's like, oh, well, these the, this is the book full of losing numbers and this oh is my the God. one winning number. Could you imagine if they actually did that? Like uh, when people go to play the lottery, they give them all the possible numbers if it was actually possible to even have them all in front of you, yeah. which is not. And you just tick one. <laughs> and you're you like supposed your, to t- you flip through one? the book and put your initials next to People would time. never play the lottery <laughs> again. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and so, but it's, it's, and so it's not like about calculating probability in an a priori way, although you can do that, um, and it it's it's about have, observing the alternatives and the impression that that makes on your mm-hmm. on your mind. So again, just sort of exploring the different ways in which belief and custom uh, here seemingly maybe belief uh, in service to custom uh, causing custom to take place how that kind of uh how that happens so now we're moving into section seven that i sorry did you want to say anything more about probability mm, not especially no i think it's pretty straightforward mm-hmm. section seven the idea of necessary connection let me let me look and see if I can remember what this chapter was about. Is this where we finally get our definition of causation? Get that word back into the common lexicon so we can use it? Oh, causation in the lexicon? What about in the etymological dictionary? <laughs> All right, fine. Good morning, clicking the skids. We took a nap. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Yet again, we have recourse to uh, Skeets's etymology. Skeets etymology. I don't know. I'm adding an extra S on there. It's it's Skeet who did an etymological dictionary, which Crowley used quite a bit. Mm. And uh, we're going to make that a special feature of our show from here on in. So looking up the word causation, we'll get a little bit further insight into the whole nature of the word, I'm sure. If I ever find it. Okay, well, we don't have causation per se, but we have cause. And it's another short one. It comes from the Latin causa. And that's about it. Okay. <laughs> okay, well... Uh, <laughs> you want to play, play us out? Play the theme again? Good morning, you the skids. We took a name. Okay. Well, back into the paper. In reality, there is no part of matter that does ever, by its sensible quality, discover any power or energy or give us grounds to imagine that it could produce anything or be followed by any other object which we could demonstrate its effect. Solidity, extension, motion, these qualities are all complete in themselves and never point out any other event which may arise from them. 
The scenes of the universe are continually shifting, and one object follows another in an uninterrupted succession, but the power of force, which actuates the whole machine, is entirely concealed from us, and never discovers itself in any of the sensible qualities of the body. We know that, in fact, heat is a constant attendant of flame, but what is the connection between them? We have no room so much as to conjecture or imagine. It is impossible, therefore, that the idea of power can be derived from the contemplation of bodies in single instances of their operation, because no bodies ever discover any power which can be the original of this idea. So we don't get forces from the contemplation of objects. We don't really get forces from observing custom. I mean, th this is what we were saying before, right? The, the secret powers of these objects that, you know, when we're doing physics, for example, to, to talk about the way objects move around each other, we postulate these forces. But he says we don't see force. We see mm -hmm. discrete objects. We only ever develop associations. Yeah. And he'll go into a lot of these kinds of ideas of why not, you know, mm -hmm. you could you could perfectly well imagine a scenario where the snow came down and was flaming hot or, you know, any any other weird contrary things that are completely against our actual expectation of events in, in reality. But yeah, we, we learned that those things aren't going to happen purely through experience. Uh, since, therefore, external objects as they appear to the senses give us no idea of power or necessary connection by their operation in particular instances, let us see whether this idea be derived from reflection on the operations of our own minds and be copied from any internal impression. It may be said that we are every moment conscious of internal power, while we feel that by the simple command of our will, we can move the organs of the body or direct the faculties of our mind. An act of volition produces motion in our limbs or raises the new idea to our imagination. This influence of the will we know by consciousness. Hence, we acquire the idea of power or energy and are certain that we ourselves and all other intelligent beings are possessed of this power. This idea, then, is an idea of reflection, since it arises from reflecting on the operations of our own mind, and on the command which is exerted by the will both over the organs of the body and the faculties of the soul. So this is an account of how we come to believe in forces at all, um, and it's going to be important a little later on when we talk about free will versus determination. Mm -hmm. um, this idea that we can we can observe secret powers in ourselves, you know, we know that that our or we imagine anyway that it's our will that causes our body to move, and so there must be some analogous force that mm -hmm. causes movements in other places. So, the we're imagining that you know gravitation, electromagnetic energy, weak nuclear force, strong nuclear force. We imagine these sorts of f forces uh, as being, um, we, we imagine them into existence by reference to the will, you know, because these are the things that move the universe. And so if the universe moves, there must be some thing mm -hmm. alike, alike to what moves our body. So reflection being uh, uh, an ob observation of what's going on when we're willing things and the apparent crux of that inner power being uh, at the same point at which we are willing something to happen. Uh, that seems to be in our observation what's going on and that's why we build this association between us willing things and that innate power to make things happen or in other words to cause things. Yeah, well, you said the word reflection so I'm, I, I think it's maybe important to uh, explain that a, a little better. What he means is like um, projecting out from the self, you know, it's like the forces we imagine in the world are, we're imagining them being reflections of our own will. Oh, like, okay. I'm know, picturing so it's, it's just like quite the opposite in the sense that my mind goes to like, for instance, Plato's Timaeus, where uh, the idea of reflection being 
reflect, meaning bend back, and the idea that uh, of being able to look inwards being the power that gives us the ability to uh, understand ourselves, and that being an important part of the Tamias, for instance. I know it's a complete tangent, but that's what was coming to mind with his application of the term reflection here, so I may have read a different interpretation into that. I think it's analogous. Like when you're talking about like the world being the macrocosm and the individual being the microcosm, we tend to, we may tend to explain what we see in the world by what we experience in our lives. And so I think all that he means is we experience movement being caused by the force of will. And so when we see movement, we have to imagine mm-hmm. that it's caused by some force. Mm-hmm. So those forces that cause the movement of inanimate objects. Uh, so when we see inanimate, like inanimate objects animating, like billiard balls knocking each other around, we have to imagine some animating force that is similar to the will. And so we say, like, I don't know, kinetic energy or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so and, it goes back to that three-part thing that he was uh, using as an example, mm-hmm. which was uh, resemblance. Uh, I th- if I'm, I'm just going off the top of my head, but resemblance, contiguity, and... Uh, causation. And causation. And so that would be causation, inferring causation based on that reflection. Yeah, well, he's trying to, he's trying to say that we don't observe forces. And so... Why do we believe in forces? If we can't observe forces, why do we believe in forces? Well, mm-hmm. uh, well, will moves humans. What moves stars? Mm. Some something like will, you know, some. Force. Yeah, and when put that yeah. way, it's kind of it makes sense to think. Well, it's the will of God that these things are caused, and that sort of thing to draw that kind of a an association. And then I haven't marked any quotations. I think this was a long chapter with a fairly straightforward resolution. So, and he give he gives a lot of. This is a actually a chapter that's fairly well argued. He's giving a lot of counterexamples. A lot of like, well, what if what if what if this is cause? Nope, can't be cause. What if this is cause? Nope, that can't be cause. So I wasn't sure how many of that stuff to include. The next section I have marked out to read is paragraph 58 here. It says, it appears that in single instances of the operations of the body, we can, by our utmost scrutiny, discover anything but one event following another without being able to comprehend any force or power by which cause operates or any connection between it and its supposed effect. The same discovery occurs in contemplating the operations of the mind on the body, where we observe the motion of the latter to follow upon the volition of the former, but are not able to observe or conceive the tie which binds together the motion of the volition or the energy by which the mind produces the effect, the authority of the will over its own faculties and ideas is not a whit more comprehensible, so that upon uh, the whole there appears not throughout all nature any one instance of connection which uh, is conceivable by us. All events seem entirely loose and separate. One event follows another, but we can never observe any tie between them. They seem conjoined, but never connected. So if we only get the idea of force by saying, will moves the body, what moves comets, maybe something like will, some force, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, But when we really think about how bodies move, it's not my will that moves my arm. (laughs) You know, it's it's my muscles that move my arm, my nerves that ask my muscles to move. Uh, um, there's something called a sarcomere, which is the contractile unit in the muscle. That, that And the sarcomeres get shorter, which means the whole muscle gets shorter. Um, just uh, on, like on Terminator, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just like in Terminator. And so there's all, we, can, we can get smaller and smaller and identify all these little processes, like this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then my arm moves. But the, the way in which consciousness, you know, it where we think of this question of how does something non-material like the mind move something material like the body like that still i think in philosophy is an open question mm-hmm. that's been answered dozens of different ways and never satisfyingly mm-hmm. so and that's uh, kind of a perfect uh, analogy because it's uh, he ends up going into this quite a bit the idea of like following effects back to their causes and trying to trace it back as far as you can, ultimately and somewhat presumptively 
to God or the gods. So if we only postulate forces in the world because we know that will moves the body, once we realize it's unclear that the will moves the body, <laughs> you know, uh, the body moves and we, we think we have will, but this template that we're using as the model for understanding how movement happens is is really not a very well-drawn template. Like, we don't know how the will moves the body. So, a force analogous to will, like gravity or something like that, uh, can we really say by analogy that, that that's what moves objects? You know, the, 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 it, it, even though it was already maybe a, a a leap in logic to imagine that inanimate objects move for the same reason animate objects do. We don't even know how animate objects move. Yeah. So that reflection makes even less sense. Yeah, and the uh, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but I feel like it's worth sort of hitting uh, briefly. It is just the, at some point when he does trace things back, he's also referencing the fact that, like, this is why he feels it's important to judge of causes based on, on the effects that we have uh, available to study versus trying to um, start from causes and understand effects and that sort of thing. So basically taking the right train of understanding in that respect. That's what I got out of it, at least. So that it's like, if, for instance, if you were to start from the gods um, and imagine them setting certain things in motion and then anticipating uh an understanding of the effects based on that the problem is you're you're inferring all kinds of characteristics of the gods that are unnecessary to understanding the effects that come after so uh if you're working away the other way starting from the effects you're only going to uh um, posit about the cause of those effects what is directly related to those effects because that's all you can uh, infer about that cause so that way when you're working your way back you're only dealing with the things that are actually observable in the cause in the effects themselves and the, the information that you have at hand yeah that's great so let's uh, let's go there in paragraph 60 he's going to give us several definitions of the word cause so that we can start using that word again because so mm -hmm. far so far we've been dealing with the fact that we can't observe causes and oh, we'll do physics. We'll talk about forces instead of causes. But forces are no good because they're just imaginary anyway. Yeah. And because we only make them up by reference to, to, to will, and we don't know how will works either. So here's a definition of cause that we can use and we can start doing science with. Suitably to this experience, therefore, we may define cause to be, in italics, an object followed by another and where all objects similar to the first are followed by objects similar to the second. That's one possible definition. Or in other words, where if the first object had not been, the second object had never existed. Uh, and then here's another one. An object followed by another whose appearance always conveys the thought to the other. And so our, our new definition of cause, you know, we've been thinking about customs so far, right? So when one billiard ball hits another, it's the custom for the, fir the, the first billiard ball to start moving a little bit more slowly and the second one to go from stationary to active. Um, and so if we run hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of experiments and never find an exception... <laughs> You know, if this seems to be always the case, then we're justified in calling it a cause. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, and if we watch the billiard balls for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, and none of them ever move by themselves, if they only move in response to someone throwing one at another mm -hmm. one, uh, then, then we know, okay not only is the movement of billiard balls absolutely sure when they bang into each other, but the non-movement of billiard balls <laughs> yeah. 
is absolutely sure when they do not bump into each other. They don't move if you don't smash them together. They always move if you do smash them together. So the smashing together of the billiard balls is the cause of the movement of billiard balls, and we can use that that word. So mm-hmm. the, the two requisite pieces for a definition are like, are like when one event always follows another or when one event couldn't possibly happen without the preceding event. And if, if, those, if it satisfies both of those conditions, then, uh, then, then you can call the event caused. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have, we've done all this work and now we've reclaimed <laughs> our, uh, we've reclaimed our idea of, of causation, um, which really just which seems just means, like an intensification of what we were talking about earlier when we still didn't have an idea of causation per se, but uh, we were making an association. So here we're just really all we're doing differently is observing the same situation over and over again in using the scientific process to be able to determine that we are correct in making an association. This is great, right? So uh, c- by custom... Canadians take their shoes off when they go into the house. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I if I put my shoes on and then remembered I didn't I didn't brush my teeth, I might go upstairs with my shoes on and brush my teeth. So customs uh, are 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 preference are soft preferences, you know? uh, mm-hmm. And so when we discover that a custom is so ingrained as to never ever be violated then we can start thinking about objects causing each other. Mm-hmm. And so without reference to force, without reference to, you know, anything spooky, without having to see a cause, we can see sequences of events that are similar and start to postulate causes. Mm-hmm. So, so, yeah, again, we're getting the whole scientific method back almost by just wondering how science is possible and then and then he's sort of describing in rough terms what a what a very modern scientific method would look like and people might object to this right like he's saying well you can't we don't observe forces <laughs> you know and and so uh maybe forces are a priori right <laughs> like that that's well that's interesting maybe forces are a priori right and we do um we do physics the same way we do the same way we do geometry by just imagining mm. <laughs> imagining how forces would interact with each other and we don't actually find those things obtaining in the real world you know uh, in the same way euclidean geometry is useful uh, if you're building if if you're building a church right you know you can there are no real triangles. There just are. We've already said, said there are no real triangles because you can't draw a straight line. Mm-hmm. But what you imagine when you're doing geometry about how triangles work, the 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 not triangles that exist in the real world are close enough that mm-hmm. they that 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 they're, they're close enough approximations that they're good enough for building churches. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. your a priori uh, interpretation of geometry is like an interface that actually does work directly with uh, the way that things actually work out there. And so maybe when you're doing physics and imagining forces and imagining trajectories and imagining uh, uh, in many, many, many cases, it's good enough, you mm-hmm. know, uh, uh, and and can have incredible predictive power, but it all happens a priori, you know, and the... Uh, there there are still margins of error when you apply those things to the to the real world because in the real world mass is not ever calculated exactly right in the same way straight lines are never actually drawn mm-hmm. perfectly or something so yeah i always did find it a, i mean there's always been something in my head ever since being a little kid sort of observing the fact that it feels like you have to relearn everything as if you had lived before or something like that it's like relearning everything from scratch there's certain things that uh, you grow up feeling are more innate but there's so many things that it's like you have to learn by experience your assumptions about the way the world works and depending on how you grow up i think you have you develop associations like for instance i mean i was i grew up Roman Catholic. So I had pretty strong associations with what I assumed the world was like that ended up being very rudely awakened as I grew up and became an adolescent and that sort of thing and realizing that, no, my uh, presumptions about the way that the world is are uh, mistaken. 
And, uh, there's a lot of those kinds of things that, uh, you know, you can sense as you're, as you're, as you're evolving your way through life, you know? Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's right. I mean, this is a related issue, maybe not exactly the same thing, but, um, it's kind of amazing that, that every generation, you know, every 50 years or something, we continue to push the frontier of, say, scientific understanding, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Because a hundred years ago, everything that we knew about chemistry was less than what we know now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so to learn everything about chemistry and then push the frontier a little bit. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, um, And then now someone can learning everything we know about chemistry, you know, in the same four year undergrad before they start pursuing their postgraduate work, you know, they have the same amount of time to learn 80% more material, more material (laughs) or something, you know, it's like, like you have to be schooled up to a certain level before you can start pushing the frontier. Mm -hmm. Actually, it seems like, it seems like, with every generation, that bar would be higher and higher and higher, but somehow students are able to keep meeting it, mm-hmm. you know, and, and get up to that place, learn everything there is to know, and then and then push a little bit against it. Yeah, I had a friend who was uh, in school at the time, this is years back, uh, who was in school to become a doctor. I don't, I think he ended up changing his course, but he was doing a lot of the chemistry related stuff. And uh, he was actually telling me about how you learn a whole bunch of stuff about chemistry up until a certain point. And then you discover, they teach you that all of that was actually not the way it works. Uh, (laughs) The reason being that it was all kind of like a grosser way of understanding things that functional but is not the actual way that things work in their present understanding of the the way that chemistry works so it is like kind of an interesting uh, you know it's a little bit tangential to what you're saying but it's like it's kind of on the point of uh, you know the frameworks that we come up with for understanding things yeah it's pretty wild that you wouldn't just throw all that stuff out yeah but it's the best way to teach it so people understand. Because mm-hmm. we're you know. still working with the framework of our mind, like just like he Hume was, where we're trying to understand the way that the reason works and the way that it works with other parts of the mind and that sort of thing. So the way that we understand things is using the same tools. So we still have to be able to, you know. Like if you imagine a hydrogen atom, <laughs> you know, with, with a little, uh, with one... Uh, a proton in the nucleus and one electron on that first ring or then a helium atom with two protons on that first ring and then maybe something more sophisticated with with eight electrons on subsequent rings radiating like almost like a little solar system you know with these mm. discrete objects orbiting a nucleus like a sun um that's entirely imaginary uh, it's, but it's, it's functional it, it's it's the way to do it to describe how chemical reactions happen where if you think of of, of electrons being not not particles but little but little fields of charge or something like that then you have to start thinking of the density of the electrical soup around the nucleus and uh and it has less descriptive power like imagining eight electrons as discrete objects is easier than imagining a field that's eight electrons dense or something yeah i mean it's just like looking at the actual solar system because uh we all get sort of a certain image in our minds of the planets as they radiate out from the sun you would never see that image that you have in your head if you looked at the actual solar system because there's so much space between the planets that it would just not look like that at all they're also only ever in one place at a time like Mm -hmm. you don't imagine you don't (laughs) <laughs> um, you wouldn't see those parables, parabolas, yeah. parabolas, yeah, parabola. Para- blah, 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 blah. We, yeah, it's it's that type of thing where you you dumb it down for your brain to be able to work with this information. He actually uses an, a perfect example of this as well. He mentions the uh, the idea of when we picture horses generally, mm-hmm. we still picture something particular. 
when we picture horses generally. He uses the example of like you picture a either a black or a white horse. Personally, I actually picture a brown horse, but what, that's neither here. Nor I also there. pictured a brown horse. <laughs> <laughs> I think, but him, him existing at the time that he was in in, in England and whatnot. E- either way, it's like you picture a particular kind of horse. You have an image that comes to mind. You don't have some weird general sort of encapsulation of all horse I. Uh, horseus, horses, horse, horse, horses, horses. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, you, 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 that's actually a very good point. We do have like this very particular image that comes into mind and stands in the place of the generality of it, just like the solar system or just like the the atom or whatnot. It's almost like there's like this world of forms out there that's like this perfect, <laughs> you know, i just inventing this idea now, so yeah. forgive me, but it's almost like there were some sort of a Well, you've got a revolutionized thought going forward, I'm telling yeah. you. <laughs> Uh, so now here's, this is going to piss me off here of liberty and necessity. <laughs> yeah. So we've spent all this time, uh, trying to deal with a world in which events don't have causes. And how can we do science if we can't observe cause? Well, maybe if we're careful and if we watch carefully and make sure that in every single instance, the custom repeats and there's never any exceptions then in that special case we can say we've identified a cause okay and now of liberty and necessity he's going to say there's no such thing as chance and everything is caused and that's the premise and all men already agree with that <laughs> and i don't know i i can't find the argument you yeah, know, it's it took me a long time to understand that that chapter on probability, mm-hmm. right? Because he's talking about how probabilities work and probabilities can't work because there's no such thing as cause. And no no no, it's there's a way in which objects appear to the mind and then you start imagining, you know, like mm-hmm. like and so he's explaining how probability works if there's no such thing as cause. Now, what he's going to do is he's going to say that there's no such thing as random chance and that all events, you know, so ever follow from other events and that this idea of uh, that there might be randomness or something, you know, like, like, oh, you know, we have, we have necessary causes and we have unnecessary causes. And what could, what do you mean by unnecessary cause? Like mm-hmm. everything follows from everything else. And, and and this I is another one of those things. Don't know how he gets there. Yeah, this is a and he, it's just a dismissive kind of thing. It's like nope, chance doesn't exist. We all agree on that, so uh, we're on to this subject. And uh, it it does feel like by alluding to exactly what you're saying about the idea that everything has a cause, it it alludes to the idea that there's a mechanical framework to everything that exists, and it feels like. Uh, one of the things we're seeing a lot of here in this paper is uh, several things such as this that are like constitute the first nail in the coffin of God, mm. whether he realized it or not, which he didn't. But uh, Nietzsche would realize this um, 150 years later or whatever it was, uh, that uh, this was kind of leading up to that nail that death of god and uh ultimately to ire and the idea of um all philosophy actually being uh logic uh and linguistics and just sort of quibbling over uh linguistic terms so that uh, the idea of ontologic on ontology doesn't actually mean anything except linguistically and it's an illusion that is created by linguistics and logic um, I feel like this is kind of like the first sort of step towards all of that taking place. Uh, well, that's an interesting thought. Uh, I have no idea how to uh, <laughs> interrogate it. We but, don't know. Yeah, that's just basically hints of things to come as far as I'm concerned, but we can jump into where we can ignore that for the moment and jump into the uh, what's actually on the page. So <laughs> so, uh, I, so, what he's going to do is he's going to – he's saying that everyone already agrees on liberty and necessity. And what he means by 
liberty and necessity is something like the relationship of free will to determination. Mm -hmm. Um, Do, do people, are people radically free or do we live in a deterministic universe where deterministic, the the deterministic, deterministic (laughs) universe where Neil Armstrong was always going to land on the moon, you know, Mm. uh, you know, is, is, uh, is it just one sort of possible course and we're just playing that out or do people have freedom to um, Fuck with make decisions about their own lives? And if you're saying that we don't observe causes in the world, one might expect, or at least I expected, this to be sort of a proto-existentialist thing where, mm. you know, events aren't caused by other events. Uh, we know that events happen and we know that there's, we, we observe events happening in a sequence, but who knows why? <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, it's just all this stuff just going on. And so, uh, um, can I catch you there for a moment? Yeah. Uh, I feel like the way that you're talking about this, I just want to address this. Uh, you seem to be saying that, uh, events don't have causes. I feel like, uh, the, what, the way I would parse it is, Events do have causes, but we're not able to observe the causes. We are incapable of observing the causes because we're only able to see things superficially on the outside based on the way that our senses function and our engagement with them. So we can't perceive or pierce through to the actual underlying causes. Um, so the idea that that means that causes don't exist seems to be um, the way that you're talking about it. And I feel like there's a danger to the language in that sense where it's like, it can lead to like, I mean, if we can't see, if we're incapable of seeing the causes that are underlying things, things can still be very much mechanical and deterministic. We just simply won't be able to figure out where they're leading to. If there's we a difference can, between that. If and, we can't observe causes, how do you know there are causes? Why do you think there are? There's so, a belief why in do you that, assume, yeah. Why do you assume there are causes? Well, it, that doesn't, okay, there's a difference there between um, us being able to say that there are causes and that being definitive proof that there aren't causes. Because if you say that there aren't causes, that's just as bad as saying that there are causes without us having proof of it. I think, uh, but I think usually you only defend positive propositions. If you can't prove to me there are causes, why should I believe in God? You know, like why, like you don't say there was no such thing about, there was no such person as Jesus and here's all the evidence. You say the evidence indicates there was a person called Jesus and then we evaluate the evidence. So for Hume to be saying we don't observe causes is just as good as saying there are no causes. Well, the problem I have with that. What's because. uh, Well, the problem I have with that is that it leads to assumptions that cause you to. Uh, well, I mean, if there are no causes, then it can't cause you to do anything, <laughs> <laughs> quite frankly. I retract my statement. No. Like, uh, I'm, like the, the whole point of, of, of the, the preceding chapters were to just hammer home again and again and again that we don't observe causes. We, uh, we imagining, imagining that forces describe the universe might be useful in some cases, but we have no evidence of that. And so, like, so like for him to to uh, to go from that to saying we live in a radically deterministic universe where effects naturally just follow from from causes and everything exists in this chain of you know where everything follows from everything else essentially is uh seems to me a big surprise well i'm i yeah i guess again it's like uh the difficulty here is we are determining that We do have an innate tendency to develop these customs as far as belief goes uh, with what we're predicting so that we we get used to the idea that certain things are going to follow certain other things and we read into that a cause, correct? Yeah. And we see this consistently enough that we can even develop a science based on it, correct? Mm Mm-hmm. So based on that, we still have something there to study. And uh, from it, we infer that there are causes and there are effects, correct? Um, We're allowed to use the word cause if if we always see, if we see a, a custom never being violated. 
but it doesn't actually mean cause. It just means that we can make predictions. Mm-hmm. It, 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 so it, I guess that means we need to define our terms. So we talk. Are you saying that the cause that doesn't exist is volition, or is it uh, cause as in these effects are being caused by something that precede the effects? You see, what I mean, the language is important here because it it does sort of nail down. Yeah. So so um, uh, one event follows another event, mm-hmm. and this is this is what we call custom. And if 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 the events, if similar events always follow similar events, then we're within our rights to call those things caused. But that's what happens in our minds that just gives us permission to use that word that we're already using it doesn't actually mean that the events are causing each other because we can't observe the causes we just buy ourselves the freedom to use that word if we see that this similar kind of event always follows another event in that case then uh, i can see where we haven't come to a determination of what that situ what that relationship is i can understand that but then to say that causes don't exist as a result of that seems like a pretty definitive uh determination of the situation that we haven't quite actually we've acknowledged that we're unable to uh actually inquire into well Causes don't exist in the same way centaurs don't exist. Once I see one, I'll believe in them. <laughs> but we can't see them. That's the whole. That's the whole point. <laughs> Only to the last hundred them, pages. Uh, yeah, we, we, yeah uh, we can infer them though. So, like, I mean, if we, we, do we can't them, see the center a, of uh, a problem, we can't see the center of the Earth, right? Right. But we can infer what exists, what what qualities it has based on uh, what we can see and what we can measure and that sort of thing, right? Um, this, is, this is wild to me. I'm very, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, I'm, so I'm trying to find this place in here because uh, I don't even know uh, if I've marked it out as something important enough to read. Um, but I'm trying to find the place where he talks about unnecessary causes or something like that okay. and, and, and says that that concept is ridiculous because mm. that might be the clue, right? Gotcha. Um, cause, cause we've established that we're allowed to use the word cause if one event always follows another event. So if he's going to say that the idea of unnecessary causes is ridiculous and that, events always must follow other events, then maybe that's why we're allowed to say everything is caused. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can't find it. So I'll have to do it from memory. And if so, if I may make a mistake, pe- people can correct me in the comments. Uh, but there's somewhere where he talks about uh, how events follow each other in sequence. Mm-hmm. And some events are seen as necessarily following each other in sequence, like like uh the 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 body won't be nourished if i don't eat the bread mm-hmm. um and some events are seen as incidental and i think he might say that that's a bit silly that once we have our idea and 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 i i'm going to hop over to your side of this argument even though i think it doesn't make sense <laughs> uh because i think you might be right about what he means mm. um so we've got this idea that that if we see necessary connections as causes and we're going to let ourselves use that word even mm-hmm. though we don't observe causes well we can just say that every event that follows every other event is caused because the the idea that some event might happen and then some other thing might happen following that as a coincidence is it, it it's it's like a little bit silly maybe right like mm-hmm. like if we see events in succession uh, even if the causes are opaque to us, like it's like he'll use the he'll talk about the weather, right? Like, mm-hmm. uh, like the weather is dependent on so many different forces that it's unpredictable. But we, we would never say that it's not caused just because it's not predictable. Mm-hmm. You know the 
the the wind moves in the direction that it does and the humidity works in the way that it does and and the sun hits the the atmosphere in the way that it does and the consequence of this is like maybe a rainstorm or something and so we can think even though our definition of cause is a little bit laboratory we have to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat the experiment to prove that one event always follows another in order to get the cause once we've done that a few times, what we can step back and, and postulate is that maybe all events are caused because we always see events happening in a succession, even though we don't understand how those causes work. Maybe, maybe all natural events are caused. And that gets us well enough into the beginning of this chapter that we can start discussing it. And I think that's a l- little bit problematic, and I wish I could find some some mm-hmm. more quotations defending that more clearly, but maybe you're right. Maybe that's what he means. And I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, yeah, it, it sounds like that might even be the thing that I was talking about earlier where, uh, I was taking it to mean the idea that instead of trying to imagine the cause first and then work your way to effects, uh, to understand the present state of things, for instance, it's better to start from the effects and work your way back to the cause so that you're not inferring things about the cause that, uh, uh, that aren't clearly present in the direct effects of it. So what you're remembering there, we're about to read that. Okay, gotcha. Uh, and uh, and so what's happening is that he's he's talking about liberty versus necessity, by which we mean free will versus determinism. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's taking this weird approach, this weird sort of you know, sideways approach where he's saying, everyone already agrees about this. Mm -hmm. And so he's trying to prove that everyone already agrees about this instead of proving his point, which makes the argument very confusing. And Uh, I do, yeah, I think it's worth uh, emphasizing there's a a line there that I could probably dig up if I uh, took a moment, but it's basically uh, emphasizing that uh, liberty shouldn't be put in opposition to necessity, but uh, because that gives a mistaken impression that liberty is, is free means you're free to think or do what you want which isn't really true there's going to be causes to the way that you're acting and that sort of thing so it's it's more like liberty versus constraint Mm. the way that he parses it so constraint meaning like if you were chained up in a dungeon then you're unable to uh to move around freely and do as you will uh so uh, so here he is wondering why people don't realize they already agree about this. <laughs> I have frequently considered what could possibly be a reason why all mankind, though they have ever without hesitation acknowledged the doctrine of necessity in their whole practice and reasoning, have yet discovered such a reluctance to acknowledge it in words and rather have shown a propensity in all ages to profess the contrary opinion. I assume the contrary opinion being liberty. Mm-hmm. That so, we, have, we are free and so have free will. Everyone already acknowledges necessity, but pretends they believe in liberty. The matter, I think, may be accounted for after the following manner. If we examine the operations of the body, again, here we're doing this. If we examine the operations of the body and the production of effects from their cause, we shall find that all our faculties can never carry us farther in our knowledge of this relation than barely to observe the particular objects that are constantly conjoined together and that the mind is carried by a customary transition from the appearance of one to the belief of the other. But though this conclusion concerning human ignorance be the result of the strictest scrutiny of the subject, men still entertain a strong propensity to believe that they penetrate farther into the powers of nature and perceive something like a necessary connection between cause and effect, when they again turn their reflection towards the operation of their own minds and feel no such connection and mode of inaction, they are thence apt to suppose that there is a difference between the effects which result from material force and those which arise through thought and intelligence. That's only half the paragraph, but let's pause there for a moment. So, in the real world, we don't observe causes, Mm -hmm. uh, but we believe that we do. You know, we we can get so granular with our observations, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, that, um, that it seems like we have 
the events are so closely related, this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, we can describe the whole process of digestion, for example, uh, that it feels like we've understood the cause. Whereas, why am I thinking what I'm thinking? I don't know. The thoughts just kind of occur to me. So, we think there's a difference between observing causes in the real world and experiencing kind of uncaused thoughts, feelings, emotions, activities in our, our behavior seems uncaused. We feel like we can't see that. We just, we, we make decisions and we do things. And so by spending all this time proving to us that we don't observe causes, it, not proving to us, stating again and again that we don't <laughs> observe causes in the real world, once we've confronted that reality, then it seems less different. We don't observe causes in the material world just like we don't observe causes in our mind. So the difference begins to break down. <laughs> you know, it stops being the case that, um, that our own motives are mysterious to us, unlike the motives of planets, which, you know, we can postulate forces. And, and it just becomes planet, the movement of planets is mysterious. Our movements are mysterious. But if we can postulate that the movements of planets are radically determined by causation, <laughs> then maybe we can postulate that our own movements are radically so it's, determined it's by causation. So it's the reverse of the previous uh, observation, yeah. where we inferred a, a inner volition to the planets. Where, yeah. Yeah, now we're doing the reverse of that. That's actually a great point, right? Because uh, we, before we imagined that forces were something like the will, mm -hmm. but now we don't believe in forces because, and, and we see that we don't really know how the will operates. We don't really know how forces operate. So we can say that like, oh, you know, things are just causing each other. So maybe we're just causing each other. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, maybe we can cut this, but I'll read the other half of that paragraph to see if there's anything productive. When again they turn their reflection toward the operations of their own mind and they feel no such connection uh, of the motive in action, they then are then apt to suppose that the difference between the effects which result from material forces and those which arise through thought and intelligence. But being once conceived that we know nothing farther of causation of any kind than merely constant conjunction of objects and the consequent inference of the mind from one to another, and find that those two circumstances are universally allowed to have place in voluntary actions, we may be more easily led to own the same necessity common to all causes. And though this reasoning may contradict the system of many philosophies in ascribing necessity to the determinations of the will, we shall find upon reflection that they dissent from it in words only, not in real sentiment. Necessity, according to the sense in which it is here taken, has never yet been rejected, nor ever can, I think, be rejected by the philosopher. So he's just doing this frustrating thing where yeah. he insists that he's <laughs> right and everyone already agrees with him. And so let's try to find one more quotation that sort of wraps up this argument and says that, uh, well, let's read what you wanted to read. Uh, paragraph 72. It would seem indeed that men begin at the wrong end of this question concerning liberty and necessity, when they enter upon it by examining the faculties of the soul, the influence of the understanding, and the operations of the will. Let them first discuss a more simple question, namely, the operations of the body and the brute, unintelligent matter, and try whether they can th from there form any idea of causation and necessity except the constant conjunction of objects and subsequent inference of the mind from one to another. If the circumstance is form in reality, the whole of that necessity, which we conceive in matter, and if these circumstances be only universally acknowledged to take place in the operations of the mind, the dispute is at an end, at least must be owned to be thenceforth merely verbal." But as long as we will rashly suppose that we have some farther idea of necessity and causation in the operations of external objects, at the same time that we can find nothing farther in the voluntary actions of the mind, there is no possibility of bringing the question to any determinate issue while we proceed upon so erroneous a supposition. So, look, he's saying that let's start by examining actions and reactions. 
Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, rather than thinking about uh, like a psychologist and like, oh, why did he behave that way? You know, what's going on in his mind? And like, think, yo, was, you know, was my hand on a hot plate and I removed it? Or did I act out because I was offended by the actions of someone else? You know, am I, am I angry because I was humiliated? Like, like if, if there's a behavioristic solution, then uh, rather than a psychological solution, then it's, it's much easier to say that we live in this world of necessity, right? We don't need to involve mental processes at all. If we start by just looking at people and saying, well, does their behavior make sense? Does the, does the input match the output? Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and he does have certain psychological accounts. He talks about different emotional motives, like different qualities that, that motivate people. But, uh, There's a, uh, but those are still, th- those are still like, he, he says that the, it's the same motives for the same actions again and again and mm-hmm. again all throughout history. Yeah, there's an anecdote that comes to mind from the movie Clerks, where uh, the the two clerks are sitting behind the counter and some customers just idly commenting on something that he's reading. And uh, the two clerks are arguing over free will and, and like the idea of, you know, having your personal volition to be able to make changes in your life and that. And uh, so the one character, Randall, at some point in the conversation decides to spit on the uh, – like the, all the water that he's been drinking on to the customer and the customer gets all pissed off and, and storms off. And, uh, of course, Dante is like, why did you do that? He's like, to prove a point, because, uh, I'm proving that I, you know, you're saying that all my actions are determined and I'm showing you that no, they're not. And it's like, that's, uh, that little scene doesn't actually prove anything of the sort because it's uh obviously he's doing that specifically motivated in yeah. a certain way and coming from certain character qualities and that sort of thing so it's still very much easy to argue that as being deterministic um I, we've been going about two hours we don't have to finish everything we planned to finish so let's not do any more quotations but i think we've sort of explained how science what we set out to do in terms of science working well in the absence of causation or mm-hmm. the absence of a of a apprehension of causation and then this little thing about liberty and necessity i thought was important because the stellamites were concerned with yeah. liberty he does say that um if by liberty we mean the choice to act or not to act then that's fine we have we have liberty um and that's weird <laughs> but if we act then our actions are determined uh um so that's the that's the big choice we have is is to restrain ourselves or to let our passions take over i guess so if we live in a radically deterministic universe then one of the big one of the big problems that um that people continue to think about even up to today is how do we punish crimes mm-hmm. um yeah, if people don't have any control over the fact that they're committing these crimes, then how do you punish them for that? Uh, and uh, and he, this is where he starts sounding like an atheist, right? Like, well, if if we live in a radically determined universe, then all the horrors were initiated at the first moment of creation, mm-hmm. and they were all built in there by God. Mm-hmm. And so he gives a couple of possible refutes. He says the you know the best of all possible worlds refute is is uh it is a decent one that you know if he stopped the boer war from happening <laughs> that if god stopped the boer war from happening maybe the way the history played out there'd be some other positive thing that was necessary that didn't happen and that that on balance it, from a utilitarian perspective the way history actually plays out is uh it is the greatest good for the greatest number, the greatest mm. number of people. So the suffering that exists is necessary in order to obtain. So it's the best possible world. He also has another uh, counter argument that he thinks is less good. So I don't remember what it is, and that's fine because it's less being, good. Yeah, like two two interpretations of God that you could end up with by working your way back to God as the cause of these yeah. this situation. One of which was that God's fallible. And, uh, of course, that's not something he could swallow being, you know. Yeah, um, I just think, I think it sounds, uh, I think he's, um, it sounds like atheistic 
mm-hmm. reasoning. This is what know? I mean. It sounds like he's he's like inevitably creating this situation that he has no means of containing uh, or controlling. Uh, I don't really get the sense that he wants to con- create this this scenario, this atheistic scenario. I feel like he's. Uh, at least giving lip service, if nothing else, to the idea that uh, uh, we should still be Christians and and that sort of thing, but using that out of Christianity being based on belief and faith uh, rather than on rational reasoning and that sort of thing. Uh, He gives a couple of accounts of how you can justify punishing crimes, one being that we live in a radically deterministic universe where we do punish crimes. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So, like, you know, People commit crimes, we have social standards, uh, and we try to hold people to those social standards, and that's just the way it works. And then the other one, which is a little bit uh, less laissez-faire, is is for the sake of convenience. Uh, So, um, we're we're not punishing criminals, we're just removing antisocial elements from Mm -hmm. society so that things move a little bit more smoothly. Mm-hmm. So if if your big worry about liberty is that without liberty you can't do justice, then you just say we're doing justice on pragmatic grounds mm-hmm. because um, uh, because we just always have. So that's part of our radically deterministic condition and um, and and we need to do it in order for, civilization to, to, I, to move think, along the way that it that, that it, it needs to yeah and i think this is why he set himself up at the very beginning at the outset with uh, the idea of the two possible routes which are the moral philosophy and the abstruse philosophy uh so that he could explore the abstruse philosophy throughout this paper but still have the moral philosophy as sort of a backup, uh, as uh, just as legitimate in his mind. And in fact, I think the way that he closes up the paper, which we'll, we're not going to get to, but we can address is just uh, that he's going to uh, point out that you can have an overemphasis on reason and uh, th- using that abstruse philosophy where you essentially uh, break everything down uh, and become too hyper skeptical. And he's he's sort of trying to strike a, a place, a balance of some sort where there's a, a, a high degree of skepticism combined with the ability to reintroduce some of those other ideas such as the uh, uh, moral philosophy. Why is this important for Thelemites? Uh, what was the – do you remember the context of the footnote where Crowley referred to – you know, as in this paper or whatever. Oh, God, no. <laughs> no? Um, Not offhand. Uh, I mean, some of the stuff we talked about last month, was it last month or was it the end of last season where we were talking about people who maybe... Uh, um, oh, yeah, it was last month because it was the thing from uh, Energized Enthusiasm where he says uh, uh, madness is disordered mm. and, um, and, and genius is ordered. Both mm-hmm. are spontaneous, both are, you know, have similar yeah, things, similar but one qualities. is ordered. And, and so this idea of the skeptical approach and understanding how reasonable people reason is, uh, is, is part of the preliminary training for, mm-hmm. for Crowley and the AA. And so these were examples, uh, although I found this paper pretty frustrating mm-hmm. for Crowley, David Hume's essays are examples of masterpieces of skepticism, how mm-hmm. you should approach carefully uh, reasoning from one proposition to another. So maybe if we do more David Hume at some point, we should do something that is called an essay so we can see if, mm. if it's more... Um, so not three dialogues on natural religion, which is the other m- most famous one, mm. uh, but but something that's called uh, something that's called an essay. So if we can see if they are more sort of connected than I found this to be. <laughs> but uh, I mean, honestly, this was there was a lot of really good usefulness to this, and I could see where it, he, Crowley would recommend this. Uh, I think anything that you're reading, you have to be able to uh, play your own devil's advocate with, mm-hmm. and and not just take 
whole cloth um, for granted or anything like that. But uh, I think there's a lot of stuff in here that's really good. And I do think it's a, an excellent primer for getting into philosophy and starting the argument at as close to square one as you can get without having to go back 2,500 years or something like that um, right off the bat. Although that doesn't hurt either. Uh, and yeah, and again, anything you're reading, you're going to have to take with it the bad with the good. I mean, in this case, this is uh, going back uh, into the 1700s to a Protestant who's uh, in England and is going to have a particular worldview um, that predates a lot of the stuff that we take for granted nowadays. Uh, and this account of how we know things, right? Like Crowley is sometimes asked if he believes in demons or if he believes in God. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, well, it depends on what you mean by belief. Yeah. You know, like, like, do I think it's real? Well, I, I, I've had experiences of gods and demons. Like, you know, mm. I, I, I did the... So, so in a sense, I believe in demons the same way I believe in dreams or you or anything else by mm. reference to my own personal experience. So, um, the devil may not be real, but he's at least as real as you are by <laughs> reference to my own experience, you know. Uh, just like Iowa, I, maybe not the devil, but like Iowa's, you know, I was in the room with him, I saw what he looked like, I kind of heard his voice, you know, it, uh, I have the same evidence for Iowa's that I have for you. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, y you know, who knows if it's real, but... Uh, yeah, and I, I think there's, yeah, something useful in in observing and understanding the skeptical process, because there is an inherent danger to it in that it can completely take away all sort of sense of meaning or importance or, uh, you know, it can, it can break things down to a point where there's, they're just dry and stale and uninteresting. So there's, yeah, there's something there, you know, we, if we're, if we're going to engage with magic, then we're using skepticism as, uh, an incredibly useful tool and an important tool. Um, but it's also one that could completely make you give up magic you know, taken to uh, to an extreme in one direction. Which for a lot of people might not be the world's most disastrous outcome. Yeah, <laughs> it might be exactly what's... Uh... <laughs> uh, hey, hey uh, I didn't read this whole paper. I sort of focused on the 40 pages that we agreed to discuss. Um, I think you finished it because you just quoted a little bit from the, the last page or two. The most famous chapter of this, I think, is on miracles, should we do at some point, not next month, but at some point, another discussion that includes the chapter on miracles, or is it is it maybe not as relevant to us? I mean, I could I could sort of uh, do away with that chapter in a couple of sentences, but at the same time, maybe it would be kind of interesting. I would say, uh, how about this? Maybe uh, if you want to give it a read when you have a moment and uh, see what you think of it, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I sometimes get stuck in these YouTube pits where <laughs> uh, apologists and biblical scholars are talking past each other. Mm. You know, it, uh, like uh, the apologists are complaining that the biblical scholars don't give the Bible enough weight to speak on its own terms to, you know, uh, you know, it's like, oh, oh, they don't they don't even think it's real evidence. And then the the biblical scholars are saying, oh, apologists, you know, they 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 take their propositions as a priori true, and then they go to explore history to see what evidence they can find for mm -hmm. things they already believe, rather than taking the evidence on its own terms. And the problem is, it's just that it's two different fields. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like. Like, you're right. Fundamentally, it's two different activities. Yeah. Why do we continue having these conversations? <laughs> uh, but uh, the apologists often complain that academics dismiss, um, dismiss miracles out of hand because of something from David Hume. You know so what? So I assume that on miracles is that Now that you put that it that something. way, that might actually be a good argument for it because, uh, yeah, there's actually some interesting insights we could get uh, discussing it further. So maybe it is a really good idea for us to do but that. But that's not, is that relevant to Thelema or just explaining yes. my own YouTube rabbit hole? <laughs> <laughs> no, it is, it is relevant because uh, actually he's got some good points about the way that uh, this testimony to miracles mm -hmm. uh, develops and uh, takes on a different form. So 
like, uh, for instance, and I hope I'm remembering this from the paper and not from some other source, but uh, the idea that you have some ancient peoples who, uh, for instance, the the ancient Jews who put together the Bible and that sort of thing, and then um, had exaggerations of things. So like mm-hmm. the flood myth, for instance, we have all these flood myths from around the world even to uh, corroborate the idea of this trauma in ancient past of humanity. But uh, somebody was saying, some, somebody's saying is kind of like pointing out the fact, you know what? Yeah, people do have an, a, a tendency to exaggerate things. And people in these kinds of circumstances where you have tribal groups are going to exaggerate things or overemphasize certain things as important or whatever the case may be. They will take on a different kind of um, uh, reality for those people than they would otherwise in, for instance, a more global circumstance uh, where there's a lot more uh, ability to cross-check it against people who aren't sympathetic to the the cause and that sort of thing um which i mean obviously we here in 2024 era vulgaris we still have people believing whatever the fuck they please on the internet and coming up with all kinds of uh you know frameworks for things so that's not a solution for things either but uh but yeah that actually might be a very the reason that's relevant to us is because thelema is going to and is experiencing the same exact things. It's part of the myth-making function of humans, and it's also part of the uh, um, lie-making function of humans and that sort of thing. Uh, so it's it's the type of thing that's going to be relevant to us, especially if we are going to try to remain skeptical while dipping ourselves into the uh, the field of provisional belief in certain ideas and whatnot let's uh try to find a way to fit it in uh not next month i don't even know this year but Mm -hmm. it sounds like uh it sounds like it's worth we did half the paper we might as well finish it yeah yeah and it sounds like you have a defense of it that makes it makes it work for us Mm -hmm. and if you can find that original Crowley reference because I bet you dollars to donuts he's referring to the chapter on miracles so if we could even get the context of why Crowley wants you to, <laughs> wants you yeah. to read this that would be even more helpful yeah that's a good idea alright 93 Darren thanks All very right. much thank you once again 93 Thanks for listening. Look for Toronto Thelema on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Watch for events in the city. And join us again in the darkly splendid abodes. <laughs> Did I kill enough time for you to remember why you wanted to talk about the OTO? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, th- I think the heat doesn't do much for sharpness of wit. This will be a great conversation. Yeah, exactly. Then. This is good. Crash and burn. I say, I say, I keep my feathers numbered for just such an occasion. <laughs>